Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. Thank you so much for being here today, May 8, 2019, for our RN and Allied Health Telehealth Lecture. A uh, few things I want to go over before we get started. Uh, if you are having any technical difficulties, call us 919-445-1000. Uh, you can also email us uncn at unc.edu. Our website is unccn.org. Lots of information about past lectures, future lectures, all sorts of things telehealth related, and also a link to our learning portal where you can go and take this and many, many other courses uh, on, your, on your own time, on your own schedule. And this course will be available for a full year after uh, we put it up on, on the learning portal. So if you want to spread the word about this and other courses to your friends and colleagues, please do. All right, let's uh, move on. To, uh, lots of social media places you can find out about us as well. Twitter, Facebook. We, we do ask that if possible you friend us there and uh, spread the word about this program. We, we really appreciate that. All right, we will be using Poll Everywhere to interact with our presenters today, and it's very simple to do that. I think the easiest way now to do that is just to go to pollev.com, P-O-L-L-E-V dot C-O-M forward slash U-N-C-C-N. You can do that on a browser on your phone, on your, your smartphone, your tablet, your computer, etc. You'll see the questions come up. You'll be able to respond to them, and then at the end you'll have an opportunity to ask your own questions there. If you would prefer to do this through texting on any phone with texting capabilities, you certainly may do that as well. All you need to do is just in the to field, type in 22333. In the message field, type in UNCCN. You do that, you get a response back that you've joined, and then you can go ahead and respond to the letters that, that uh, correspond with the, the correct answers and uh, then ask questions at the end. All of this is anonymous. We encourage you to, uh, to respond to all of the questions. It does make for a better lecture to have that engagement. So uh, we, we look forward to that. OK, and the, the question that we'll ask first off is, which of the following is a standard screening method for prostate cancer? And if you think that's a mammogram, you put A, colonoscopy, B, low-dose uh, computed tomography, LDCT, you put C, or prostate-specific antigen PSA, you put D. Hopefully this is a bit of a softball here, but we'll get you familiar with using this tool. All right. And without further ado, we want to say welcome to Meredith Crabtree and Mark Beerland. Thank you both so much for being here today. Mm -hmm. uh, Meredith, we uh, know that you joined the UNC urology team in 2018 practicing both benign and urologic oncology, mm -hmm. and an active member of the American Urological Association. Prior to joining UNC, he worked as a nurse practitioner in endocrinology and internal medicine, and received a bachelor's degree in nursing here at UNC Chapel Hill, and a master's degree in nursing at Vanderbilt University. That's right. Great. What's one thing that I didn't mention there that we should know about you? Um, I enjoy gardening in my free time. I bought a house last year, oh, and uh, it's been a big project. The yard needed a lot of work. So we, that's really what I do in all my free time, it seems like, is uh, landscaping, gardening, working out in the yard. What fun. And this, yeah. this is a beautiful place Good. to, to garden if, if, if you can yeah. keep things from being eaten by the deer. Yeah, exactly. So, um, all right. Uh, Mark, uh, you have clinical pr practice focused on neurologic oncology, particularly the treatment of bladder, prostate, testes, and kidney cancer. A uh, member of the Integrated Multidisciplinary Genitourinary Oncology Group at the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, and uh, participates in research focused on employing advanced surgical procedures, including the use of robotic surgery to maximize the quality of life for people with urologic malignancies. About right? Indeed. Yep. All right. What about for you? What's one, one thing we should know? That well, doesn't... I am uh, recently married. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Two months ago, and my wow. wife and I just moved here uh, from New York City. And full disclosure, we've never stepped foot in this state uh, prior to the day we interviewed <laughs> wow, here. Wow, surprise. <laughs> yeah, but we are happy to now be living in North Carolina. Good for you. Well, welcome welcome to North Carolina. Thank you. Thank Glad you. to have you here, and, and congratulations again on, on your new marriage. Thank you. Um, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and move on to uh, our, oh, and there's the bio uh, for, for Mark. 
And let's take a look at the poll. Ah, that, I think we're trending with a D here. How are they doing? <laughs> doing great. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Good. Thank you all for, for answering that first question. And we promise they'll, they'll become more challenging. Okay, so let me turn this over to you, Meredith. Um, prostate cancer screening and the nurse's role. Yeah. And again, you can just use this, this, uh, the right left arrows on the bottom and then the mouse is a cursor. That's Perfect. helpful. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Meredith Crabtree. I'm a nurse practitioner here with UNC Urology. Um, as you mentioned, I practice both benign and urologic oncology here in our group. Uh, my contact information is on there. If you have any questions afterwards, just let me know. So I'm going to talk about prostate cancer screening, the basics, and also the role of the nurse uh, and the APP to be the nurse practitioner or PA. So briefly going to touch on just the physiology. Um, the prostate's a glandular and muscular organ in the lower pelvis, an accessory reproductive gland um, that secretes an alkaline fluid that helps sperm to get where it's going, aids in the motility and the nourishment of sperm, and it's a, the average size is about 30 to 50 cc's, which is about the size of a walnut. Um, you can see here on the slide, uh, there are different zones of the prostate. Um, this darker zone down here is the peripheral zone, takes up about 70% of the prostate, uh, and this is actually where most prostate cancers arise from. Um, the majority of prostate cancers are adenocarcinomas, meaning they come from the glandular cells of the prostate. There's also a few other zones, transition zones, central zone, and then a uh, fibromuscular stroma area. For those of you who have maybe not thought about prostates in a while, uh, I put this slide in there just to orient you to where it is, just to remind you, posterior to the bladder there, uh, you can see it sort of sits like a donut around the, the urethra. Epidemiology. Um, prostate cancer is the most commonly diagnosed non-skin cancer in men. There's about 3 million men living with prostate cancer in the United States. Men have a one in nine uh, risk of being told they have prostate cancer, and it's the second leading cause of cancer death in men in the U.S. Uh, behind lung cancer, which is a surprising statistic to some. Uh, one in 41 men will, will actually die of prostate cancer in their life. This um, slide sort of highlights the overall survival rates and why we think prostate cancer screening is really important. You can see that when prostate cancer is caught early, um, there's actually really good survival rates for it. Uh, localized and regional prostate cancer rates actually have nearly 100% five-year relative survival rates. Um, distant metastatic disease has a, has a much lower uh, survival rate than local or regionalized prostate cancer. The clinical presentation of prostate cancer, typically asymptomatic. Typically, this is called on routine prostate cancer screening. Uh, sometimes men present with lower urinary tract symptoms like frequency, urinary urgency. They may have blood in their urine. Um, if it were metastatic, advanced disease, they might have bone pain in their hips or their pelvis or their back. Um, and if the prostate has, has grown up and obstructed their urethra, they may have a bladder outlet obstruction presenting as renal failure. So, let's see there. There's my, so the, um, oh, here's our question. Uh, which of the following is not a known risk factor for prostate cancer? So I did this the hard way. You get the question first, and then we're going to go over the answer. Um, so is it a family history of bladder cancer, age, family history of prostate cancer, or ethnicity? And... If you'll take just, just a few more seconds to answer this, again, uh, this is completely anonymous, so take a risk. Go ahead and, end, and uh, put what you believe to be the answer. All right. Meredith, how are they doing? They're doing, they're doing pretty good. Um, so risk factors. Age is a risk factor. More than 60% of folks are diagnosed at age 65 or older. Um, race, ethnicity is a risk factor for uh, receiving a diagnosis of prostate cancer. African-American men have the highest incidence of prostate cancer and are also more likely to die of prostate cancer than Caucasian men. Um, when we're screening these guys for prostate cancer, we ask about history of metastatic or lethal adenocarcinomas. So that would include a family history of prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer. And if you have a first degree relative with a history of prostate cancer, you yourself have a one, uh, have a twofold risk of being diagnosed in your lifetime. So the answer to that previous question um, was bladder cancer, not a known risk factor for, uh, for prostate cancer. 
So another question, which of the following is an AUA recommendation for prostate cancer screening? Is it screening for all men should begin at age 40, regardless of risk factors? Men with, an in with increased risk factors for prostate cancer should consider beginning screening before age 55. Prostate cancer screening should begin at age 75, or prostate cancer screening should begin at age 65. We'll give you a few moments to answer that. I, this one's a little tricky with the wording, so I apologize for that. Okay, so moving on, the AUA recommendations. Um, the AUA recommends against screening in men under 40 years of age. Just the incidence of prostate cancer in that population is so low. Um, men at an average risk of prostate cancer should undergo shared decision-making with their healthcare provider to begin screening uh, at around age 55. And men that are high risk, so men that had two or more of those risk factors we just talked about, uh, it should be an individualized decision with their healthcare provider based on their risk factors to begin screening uh, before age 55. So the answer to that one was that the AUA recommends um, considering to begin screening before age 55 if you have uh, one or more of those risk factors. So the basics of prostate cancer screening. Um, the basics of screening is a prostate exam, which we call the digital rectal exam, we abbreviate as the DRE, and the uh, PSA blood test, which is your prostate-specific antigen. Uh, that's a protein produced exclusively by prostate cells. We also look at the PSA in a few different ways. Uh, we use the volume of the prostate to calculate prostate density, uh, and we're more concerned when there's a denser prostate. We're more concerned about that prostate harboring a cancer. Uh, we look at PSA velocity, which is how the PSA changes over time, and the free PSA, the level of unbound PSA in the blood. There's also new tools that Dr. Beerlin is going to talk a little bit more about, biomarkers, MRI, targeted biopsy, and how we can do, uh, how we can better screen people beyond just these, this basic level. Our goal of screening when we're doing this is to identify a higher risk prostate cancer that will affect a patient's quality of life that we can hopefully successfully treat. And there's benefits of early detection. Um, obviously, that would be preventing the morbidity and mortality associated with metastatic disease. And unfortunately, there can be harms of early detection of prostate cancer, too. Uh, the psychological distress of undergoing a prostate biopsy. Uh, I haven't had one myself, but I, I hear they're not fun. <laughs> the potential complications of biopsy, including bleeding, pain, infection, uh, and the possibility of overtreatment, that a patient would make a decision to treat a prostate cancer that wouldn't have actually affected affected their life. So this slide talks a little bit about uh, factors that can affect the PSA, including things that can cause the PSA to be artificially elevated or artificially decreased. Um, things that can make the PSA falsely higher uh, would be infection, lab error, inflammation of the prostate, um, so prostatitis, urinary tract infection, urinary retention, um, BPH, uh, intercourse within 48 hours of having it checked. And then artificially decreased would be meds that we use to treat BPH with. So there's medications like finasteride, dutasteride, uh, lab error, and large amounts of certain types of chemotherapy can also, um, can also cause the PSA to be artificially decreased. Um, I like this slide because while it does note some of these things that can be artificially high, uh, there should never, none of these should be a reason to discount a consistently elevated PSA. Uh, a patient that I saw um, last year had come to us at age 65 uh, with a PSA that had actually been elevated for two years. It had been checked five times in the course of two years and had been over 10 that entire time. Um, he was an avid cyclist, cycled every day, you know, like 100 plus miles a week. Uh, and his, his uh, primary health care provider had unfortunately just reassured him, you know, that this is, your PSA is only elevated because you cycle. You know, this is definitely what's causing this. Um, and, you know, he had checked it over the course of two years, still elevated. And by the time he got to us for a biopsy, he actually had pretty advanced um, disease that had spread outside of his prostate. And if he'd come to us earlier, we would have been able to help him with an MRI, sort of, you know, stratify uh, his risk a little bit better and help him decide whether or not to go through the biopsy sooner rather than later. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit, talk about the role of the nurse and, or the nurse practitioner in uh, prostate cancer screening and also through the treatment of prostate cancer. In our group, we monitor um, elevated PSA. We monitor patients that are on active surveillance. Uh, we help to manage urinary symptoms that can come along with prostate cancer. We also counsel patients on the risk factors and stay up to date on the screening guidelines. 
And also a big role for us is patient education. I've heard several times, uh, you know, when talking to patients about prostate cancer screening, no, nobody dies from prostate cancer, so I don't need to worry about that. Or I don't believe in PSA. I like that one a lot. So I'm like, what, what do you not believe in? <laughs> um, but when I hear these things, it's really a, a clue to me that there's definitely some need for patient education. And while some patients might not want to undergo screening, they might not want to know if there's a prostate cancer there, uh, we obviously respect that decision. But when I hear things like nobody dies from prostate cancer, if they just don't have all the information, so it's definitely uh, room for us to, to help with patient education there. Another big role for APPs in our group is reinforcing the discussion on treatment options, side effect management, and the post-operative pathway. Um, there was an article in the uh, Journal of um, Surgical Oncology that said that patients um, over the age of 60 that have received a new cancer diagnosis have a significant issue retaining information on the first day they meet their, their uh, surgeon, their urologic surgeon. Um, so, and I don't know if you remember a few slides back, I said that most of our patients are diagnosed at age 65 or older, so these are our guys we're talking about, you know, men over the age of 60, uh, so, and as they age, their ability to recall information presented to them one time significantly decreases with age. Um, also, men with a poor, the study said that men with a poor prognosis also have a harder time uh, recalling information about their treatment options, you know, post-operative pathway, uh, and how to make that decision. So. To me, this really highlights uh, a good role for nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs in our group. Um, a lot of what we do is just reinforcing those discussions that are initiated by our physician counterparts on, on treatment options and how to manage the side effects and, and all that comes with uh, prostate cancer and, and making a treatment decision for it. There's also um, mental and emotional implications of prostate cancer treatment. Uh, we screen for this routinely in our, in our group. Um, a previous job that I had was working uh, with the faculty at the UNC School of Nursing, uh, Dr. Lee Shin Sung, whose primary research is on the mental and emotional implications of having to make a decision about treating a prostate cancer, whether that be making a decision to do active surveillance, uh, undergo a prostatectomy, or choose radiation, chemotherapy, hormone therapy, and then also how patients and their partners cope afterwards. Uh, how do they cope with the side effects of treatment? Um, in our group, we also uh, help to manage the side effects of treatment. Um, those can include urinary incontinence and erectile dysfunction. We talk a lot about pelvic floor physical therapy, pelvic floor rehab, make referrals when appropriate. Uh, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox here in urology to help with the erectile dysfunction, but we also can refer them to get penile prosthesis when needed. Um, our APPs do surveillance for disease recurrence, and we also create a survivorship care plan with the patients outlines the treatment that they had, um, and really is a time after treatment to kind of regroup, touch base, how are things going, are you handling everything okay, let's make sure we're all on the same page about going forward, you know, do you need any more treatments or not, we again review your final pathology, because many patients, they hear it once and again, they're like, you know, I heard it, but I don't, I don't really remember much about what they told me, um, so we kind of review everything, make sure everyone's on the same base, and actually create a document that has all that information in it, and coordinate getting it to the PCP as well. So that concludes um, my uh, part of this talk. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dr. Bierlin now, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, further risk stratification uh, for prostate cancer screening and how we might do better biopsies. Thank you. All right, thank you again for the kind introduction. Um, <clears throat> the title of my presentation today will be MRI Ultrasound Fusion Targeted Prostate Biopsy and Prostate Cancer Localization and Risk Assessment. And to start off, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the current problems with the way we screen for prostate cancer. The PSA blood test that Meriden spoke about really has no certain threshold that will say above level X that all men will have prostate cancer and below level X all men won't have prostate cancer. As a result, the specificity of this blood test is actually quite poor. Moreover, in patients with higher PSAs, that does not necessarily correlate 
with more aggressive disease. And as we know, prostate cancer is on this wide spectrum of disease, where on one end it's quite indolent and may not ever require treatment, to the other end of the spectrum where it's quite aggressive and may need multimodal therapy. And unfortunately, a high PSA doesn't predict uh, either of these two ends of the spectrum. There are a tremendous number of prostate biopsies being performed as a result of an abnormal PSA, both in men without cancer, meaning that they undergo a prostate biopsy. They, we may not actually find cancer, but their PSA continues to trend up. As a result, they're put through many more biopsies. And men with prostate cancer who have been given the diagnosis of low-grade disease that doesn't actually need treatment, those men also undergo subsequent biopsy. And as a result, the number of biopsies performed in men due to PSA screening is uh, quite high. This PSA screening protocol ultimately results in overdetection of some types of prostate cancer uh, that would never lead to a man's longevity. And as a result, uh, your field of urology has been somewhat criticized as we really need to come up with a better way to screen men for prostate cancer. You've probably heard the uh, United States Preventative Task Force Service weigh in on the role of PSA screening. Uh, in the past several years, they said actually we should stop screening for prostate cancer using PSA. And then after several more studies have come out, we showed, lo and behold, PSA is not that terrible as a, as a screening tool, but we, used to, we can now use it in combination with different biomarkers and MRIs to help counsel men on the true need for a prostate biopsy. So what is the actual problem? And the problem we currently have is the biomarker itself, that is the PSA. The problem is also our response to the biomarker, meaning what do we do with an abnormal PSA? Additional problem is our biopsy itself and all the risk that comes with a prostate biopsy. And then lastly, it's our response to the results of this biopsy, meaning we diagnose both low-grade and high-grade cancer, and we often over-treat this low-grade cancer or under-treat the high-grade cancer. Ultimately, we can probably do better with all of the above problems. So this schematic shows some of the limitations of our current biopsy protocol. You can see on panel A, this is an example of a prostate with small indolent, non-aggressive tumors. Maybe I can highlight that. You can see that in some instances, we would identify these non-aggressive tumors when in fact a patient would be better off without this diagnosis because there is no treatment needed for it. In panel B, you can see that important cancers, large cancers of the prostate, are often incorrectly stratified based on our current biopsy protocol, meaning that we may sky the outside of a large tumor, not find much cancer there, and counsel the men that really you don't need any treatment because you have very low volume disease. And that's all because we can't actually see the cancer under ultrasound guidance, and that's how we do the biopsy. And then lastly, we entirely miss tumors. There's often large tumors of the prostate, and since we can't see it under a transrectal ultrasound-guided prostate biopsy, we miss the entire tumor, and then we counsel men, lo and behold, you've underwent a prostate biopsy, we didn't find any cancer, uh, you continue on with your routine health. So really we need to optimize the way we do our prostate biopsy, and we have to define what we mean by prostate optimization. And that is first we want to actually detect potentially lethal disease. The, the prostate cancer that's going to kill a man is the man that we is the disease we want to find. And at the same time we want to avoid diagnosing low risk disease, insignificant cancer that does not require treatment. So it's a fine balance of doing that. We want to generate clinically useful data, meaning we want to be able to obtain information that will help counsel men on who needs treatment and what type of treatment they need. And then lastly, we need to do this in a cost-effective manner, meaning we want to avoid repeating biopsies over and over in men who have a slightly elevated PSA. And we have to limit the number of times we put them through a biopsy, as biopsies are often costly. So in order to improve our current biopsy paradigm, we could do several things. 
One is we have to select men uh, more appropriately who actually needs a prostate biopsy. We can do that in several ways. There's new blood markers and urine markers on the, mar on the market that may help us risk stratify men who would benefit from a prostate biopsy. There's also several nomograms. These are risk calculators. We can plug in patients' variable and it will tell us the risk of them harboring prostate cancer. So we can counsel on those men who would need prostate biopsy and who could avoid a biopsy. We have to refine our technique. We often perform what's referred to as saturation biopsies, just simply putting more and more and more needles into a man's prostate, hoping to find uh, high-risk cancer in someone who may have an elevated PSA. And lastly, we really need to transition to targeted biopsies, meaning using an imaging technique to show us if there is a true abnormal biopsy in the prostate, and then direct our biopsy course at that abnormal area to help us risk stratify men who would be at risk for harboring prostate cancer. We can do this through an MRI, which I'll get to uh, farther on in our presentation, but our targeting abnormal areas found on a prostate MRI may benefit the patient in several ways, in that we would reduce the number of repeated biopsies needed, and also we could actually take that targeted core and put it through the abnormal area, increasing the actual cancer core length better grade concordance, and then we can better risk stratify men on who truly needs a prostate, or excuse me, who truly needs treatment versus active surveillance. And then ultimately our goal would be able to screen men with an MRI, and those patients with a normal MRI could then forego a biopsy altogether. So here's our first question. Which of the following is a way in which we can improve prostate cancer biopsies? One is look for the biomarkers, such as uh, prostate cancer uh, antigen 3, PHI, or 4K score. The second is perform less sampling due to avoidance of oversaturation. Use MRI to guide our biopsy. And then D, all the above. And lastly, A and C. So we could do A and C for sure and then perform less sampling to avoid saturation biopsy uh, would be appropriate in some men based on our MRI. So really, probably answers A and C would be our best answer. And that was a tricky question. So I have to confess that I came from New York University, and we developed a large imaging program, which we brought with us here to UNC. So a lot of the data that I'm going to show today came from my NYU experience, and that is reflected in now what we're building in UNC. Here you can see the schematic we use, and the men with an elevated PSA would undergo an MR-targeted biopsy. This can be done in two fashions. Either men can actually lie inside the MRI gantry itself, and then we do prostate biopsies, or they are come to our office and they do a transrectal ultrasound, and we take our MRI that was done on a prior uh, day and then fuse it together with our ultrasound at the same time. That's the protocol that's usually adopted in the United States. Some institutions in Europe do the MRI gantry biopsy. Uh, you can fuse your real-time ultrasound on top of your MRI with a number of technologies. Most commonly, we do it with a software co-registration program. And then lastly, you can do the biopsy one of two methods. One, you can go transrectally, which we commonly do in the United States, or you can do transperineal through the skin underneath the scrotum which is more commonly done in Europe and Australia. So a MRI is performed with gadolinium, and there's a number of sequences that are obtained of the prostate to give us a number of different high-resolution pictures. And you can see on this schematic the different areas that are highlighted that light up under MRI, and then we can actually detect an abnormal area. Uh, when a radiologist interprets the MRI, they actually give it a suspicion score on this Likert scale of 1 to 5, 1 meaning it appears to be a normal prostate, and 5 meaning it's highly likely there's some type of cancer there, uh, and then 2, 3, and 4 in between. So ultimately, this Likert scale will allow us to select who needs a biopsy, and men with a score of 5, high likelihood there's cancer there, they should definitely undergo a biopsy. MEMS a score of 1, a normal uh, MRI of the prostate, may be able to avoid a biopsy. 
So here is actually how an MRI looks when we fuse it on top of a real-time ultrasound. And you can see in these schematic planes the picture of the prostate with the red arrow highlighting the abnormal area. During our biopsy, we segment out the green line that shows us the borders of our prostate, followed by the yellow line that highlights the actual region of abnormality. So you can see in the bottom right uh, panel that that's the abnormal region of the, of the MRI, and the small arrows are the small cores that we've actually shown that we've biopsied the correct tumor. This is kind of a blown up version of that. You can see that's the ultrasound that would be inserted into man's rectum, the abnormal area within the prostate, and then the prostate needles that actually go through the uh, abnormal region seen on the MRI. So this paradigm of getting an MRI in men with an abnormal PSA is a new paradigm and something that we've started to adopt in the academic setting. Uh, we've shown some work that actually using uh, this protocol, we've screened up to 99% of our men in my prior institution would undergo an MRI prior to their first biopsy. And as a result of that, we think we've better risk stratified men who would actually need a biopsy. There's a number of different categories of uh, men that would benefit from a prostate MRI. First of all, men who have had a previous negative biopsy may benefit from getting an MRI, meaning they have an elevated PSA, they undergo a standard biopsy, there's no disease found, but their PSA continues to go up, suggesting that they probably are harboring some type of prostate cancer that we missed on that original biopsy because we couldn't see it. These men may get an MRI, find something abnormal, and then we can target that region. In men with known prostate cancer that is low risk, uh, who do not need definitive treatment, we can follow these men with intermittent MRIs to see is their tumor increasing in size, increasing in density, have they changed on that Likert scale, for example, did they have a region of interest that was scored a three, and this has moved up to a five over time. And then lastly, men who have had no previous biopsy that present to our clinic with an elevated PSA, we'd really like to get this MRI first prior to their initial biopsy that would allow us to detect disease and reduce their over-detection of uh, non-aggressive disease. So we're going to highlight some work that we've done studying this technique, and we evaluated just under a thousand men at my prior institution, and of those uh, men, about 745 met these study uh, inclusion criteria, and of these, about roughly uh, half had no prior biopsy, about a third had a prior negative biopsy, and a little bit less than that had uh, prior cancer. So if we look at some of our outcomes of using this MRI fusion biopsy technique, you can see on this graph that the pink column is a higher risk disease. That's the Gleason 7 or higher prostate cancer, and that's the cancer we actually want to detect. And the purple cancer is the type of cancer we'd actually like to avoid detecting. And you can see the bar on the right that using the MRI targeted biopsy technique, men who showed up who had an elevated PSA, we detected 26% of men had this aggressive disease compared to only 20% using the standard technique. Although this is uh, an improvement of only 6%, this is statistically significant, showing that we are truly uh, detecting more high-risk cancer. At the same time, you can see the purple bar is lower, meaning we are avoiding the detection of low-risk disease, and that's exactly what we want to do. We don't want to give men the diagnosis of low-risk disease that will never need any type of treatment. You can see on this slide that we evaluate the performance of our MRI fusion-targeted biopsy versus our systemic systemic biopsy, which is just the blind 12-core uh, transrectal biopsy, by indication, and our results kind of change depending on which men were biopsy, meaning that in men who have had no prior biopsy, you can see that the MRI fusion targeted biopsy detects more higher risk cancer. In patients who have negative biopsy, their rates of cancer detection uh, is low in a repeat setting, but it is higher using the MRI technique. And lastly, in men who have prostate cancer that we are following forward with uh, an MRI, we detect more high-grade disease and miss low-risk disease in that men, or excuse me, that patient cohort as well. Interestingly, uh, that five-point Likert scale that I mentioned really shows how much significant disease is there. Uh, and the left-hand 
left aspect of the side, you can see the green bars. That men with Gleason 6 cancer, the low risk cancer, uh, often does not increase as we're increasing in the risk of MRI. You can see on the panel on the right that as the MRI suspicion score increases, so that's 2, 3, 4, and 5, the likelihood that a man is going to harbor high risk disease is much higher, and the likelihood we're going to detect it using our MRI targeted biopsy technique is upwards of 90%. The biopsy indication uh, really influ influences how well we're going to detect prostate cancer. And this is a little bit busy slide, but the take-home message is that in the MRI score of three or four range, it's really the wheelhouse of using MRI because we can detect higher grade disease uh, and limiting the, the detection of lower grade disease, ultimately helping us risk stratify men who would need treatment. So if we look specifically at our cohort of men with a previous negative biopsy, that means that they showed up to our clinic for an elevated PSA, underwent a standard transrectal ultrasound-guided biopsy, uh, had no cancer found, but their PSA continues to rise. Uh, we found some interesting uh, patient characteristics and outcomes using this technique. We evaluated 214 men, and you can see on this slide, similar to the prior ones, the white bar is higher on the right side, which is our targeted biopsy, than our systematic biopsy, and the gray bar, that's the low-grade cancer that we don't want to detect, is lower in our MRI fusion tech technique, again showing how we're risk stratifying appropriately men with high-grade disease that require treatment. So we've looked at our approach of what did we actually miss, and unfortunately these turned all out black, but I can summarize that in men who had an MRI targeted biopsy technique, we did not miss any Gleason greater than 7 cancer and missed no Gleason 7 cancer, meaning that using this technique, the likelihood that we're going to find what we're looking for is quite high. Using the blind technique, the cancer is missed by systematic biopsy, you can see up to 44% of Gleason 7 cancers and almost 30% of uh, high-risk cancers are missed using this technique, which we know because we can't see the cancer using the transrectal approach. Uh, using what's called the Epstein criteria, which is a way of uh, categorizing low-risk disease, you can see the majority of patients with low-risk disease met this criteria, showing that really this is the patient population we'd rather not give them the diagnosis of low-risk disease. High-grade cancer was rarely missed in our instance. Uh, you can see here, of those that missed by uh, syst systemic biopsy, which was the uh, transrectal ultrasound uh, guidance without MRI, is low. And of these, it's actually split evenly between those tumors that are on the anterior and the posterior aspect of the prostate. Uh, moving forward, you can see that as the MRI suspicion score increases, that means that score of 1 to 5, that we increase the detection of high-risk disease. And really, it's, the score starts to jump significantly after uh, a score of 4 or higher. And when we biopsy these men, again, we can see that men with MRI suspicion scores of 4 or 5, those harboring high-risk disease, do indeed have high risk on biopsy. And those men with MRI suspicion scores 2 or 3 are much lower risk of harboring disease. And again, that Epstein criteria, which is a form of quantifying the low risk disease, is a low component. This ultimately translates into a negative predictive value that is quite high in detecting high-grade disease, meaning if your MRI is completed and the radiologist interprets it at 1, 2, or 3, you have a fairly high chance that there is going to be no cancer there. That allows us to really personalize men's counseling into who needs a biopsy and who doesn't need a biopsy. So as part of this research, uh, the American Neurological Association and the, the Society of Abdominal Radiology developed a prostate cancer statement on men who have had a prior negative biopsy. They've used a lot of the data from our prior institute, and they gave recommendations on how these men should be uh, managed. First of all, the statement said, if you're going to get an MRI, the MRI quality really needs to be high, meaning that MRIs are a little bit subjective in terms of their interpretation. MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging, and the larger magnet uh, you get for an MRI, the higher resolution picture can be. So the take home message is we have to get uh, an MRI done in a, in a quality institution. 
Uh, some of the other things this statement considered is that uh, we should really be having our MRIs interpreted by radiologists who have experience in evaluating prostate MRIs. As like I said, there is some subjective nature to interpreting it. And then when the prostate biopsy is performed, uh, the results of high volume institutions uh, have uh, better outcomes in the, as opposed to someone who's never performed this technique before. And then really, like I mentioned earlier, that those men with an abnormality score just three, four, or five are the ones that would benefit from a biopsy. Patients who've had a prior negative biopsy and have an MRI score of one and two uh, may benefit from avoiding a prostate biopsy. This biopsy can be formed as a number of ways. One, we can do it, uh, like I mentioned, using a software technique that overlays our MRI and our ultrasound. The second technique is actually biopsying a man when he's within the uh, MRI tube called in gantry. And then, then we can actually overlay the MRI and the ultrasound just visually without using any type of software called cognitive fusion. The guideline recommends when we do find an abnormal area on a man's prostate and we perform a biopsy, a minimum of two biopsy cores should be placed through each region. And then whether we should perform random biopsies in addition to that is based on individual patients. There is a slightly, uh, or I should there, there is a significant false negative rate. I mean, an MRI is never 100% perfect uh, in its detection of prostate cancer, but we do know it's much more improved than the blind uh, method. And if we do find a patient who has a high uh, risk lesion and MRI score of five and we biopsy that area and it comes back as negative, we should probably think there is a possibility that we've even missed our target or there is some co-registration abnormality with the ultrasound. So in men that we do check who have an MRI that's uh, low risk, given a score of one or two, can these men actually avoid a biopsy? And we think uh, after an institution has vetted their data and they understand what the cancer detection rate at in each institution is for this low risk MRI, men uh, can be counseled on the risks and benefits of avoiding biopsy in these low risk MRIs. So ultimately, the, the uh, joint statement was indeed a statement, not a guideline, but they did give recommendations that we should con consider uh, getting an MRI-targeted biopsy in men who have had a prior negative biopsy. And then we can add in other markers depending on their availability and cost effectiveness. So we'll move on to our next polling question. That being in this study, which, of, which, which one of the following statements is true for men with a previous negative biopsy? A, high-grade cancer was always identified by systemic biopsy. B, MRI suspicion score did not predict high-risk disease. And then C, when high-quality MRI is available, it should be strongly considered in any patient undergoing a repeat biopsy. That is indeed the right answer. We should shift gears a little bit into men who have never had a biopsy before that just shows up in our clinic. Um, we've studied these men at our prior institution just under 400 of them. And a lot of these themes will be the same. We are detecting high-grade disease, and we are missing a little bit of disease. Uh, you can see it on this slide on the left. That red bar on the very top is the slice of high-risk disease uh, that we are missing. Everything below that is low-risk disease that we prefer to miss. And you can see on the bar on the right that that green uh, bar is much lower, meaning that we are detecting the higher-risk disease. We're not missing it. As ironic as that sounds, is we don't want to give the men a, uh, a diagnosis of a low-risk cancer that's never going to affect their longevity and it's never going to uh, require treatment. We looked a little bit on which uh, cancers are we actually missing uh, when we do miss cancers, and you can see uh, on the left-hand group of uh, columns that only 3% of high-risk disease was actually missed using our MRI fusion technique uh, compared to about 12% missed. Uh, using the standard of care systematic biopsy. And again, the Epstein criteria is a low amount of these things. Based on our clinical strategies, we've talked about uh, whether we could just do our systematic biopsy alone, if we need to do our MRI fusion biopsy only for those patients uh, who have an MRI suspicion score of two or greater, three or greater, and four or greater. And you can see here what we would miss and what we would diagnose based on those strategies. Currently here at UNC, we usually recommend um, biopsying any abnormality three or higher, and then we can have a discussion with men on the risks and benefits of avoiding a biopsy with an MRI score of one or two.
From this, we've developed a number of what we refer to as nomograms uh, that allow us to counsel men preoperatively on the risk they may be harboring prostate cancer prior to their even uh, biopsy. And how these nomograms work is in the right-hand corner, if you can see, there's a 76-year-old gentleman, PSA of 6.6, .6, prostate volume of 52, and a PSA of density of 0 0.13. He underwent an MRI, and he had an MRI suspicion score of 2. So you can look at our nomogram, and our second line down is an MRI suspicion score, and you can see the number 2 is circled, and we just draw an arrow straight up from there, which will give us 0 points. We go on to our next variable, which is PSA density. This gentleman's PSA density was about 0 0.13, so we find that, and then draw an arrow straight up for that, which will give us 10 points. And then we look at the man's age. His age was 76. That's the fourth line down. Uh, we can find 76 on that metric, and then draw a line straight up, which gives us a score of uh, 15. We put these all together, add them up, it gives us a total score of 25. And you can see on the total points line, we just find 25 on that, and then we draw a line straight down, and that will give us a risk that this man has clinically significant cancer. We can do all that based on this nomogram alone, and someone with uh, a 6% risk of cancer, meaning there's a 94% chance he has no significant prostate cancer, and 76 years old, this one may be someone who would avoid uh, a prostate biopsy. And lastly, we can see this in the opposite direction. A younger man, 68 years old, PSA of 6, prostate volume of 30, with a PSA density of 20. This man has a higher MRI suspicion score, a score of 4. And if we do the same technique, find the uh, variables on each line, draw the line up to the number of points. We get 36 plus 15 uh, for his uh, PSA density, plus 12 for the age gives us a risk score of 62, or sorry, 63. We, look, we find that number on our total points uh, ruler, draw that down, and this man has a 71% chance he's going to harbor high-risk disease on his biopsy. And now we can give that information to the man before biopsy, and we can counsel them individually saying this is your risk, and given you have 71% chance, you may benefit from a prostate biopsy. Changing gears a little bit to the other topic we're going to touch base on today, uh, men with prostate cancer, there's a number of standard of cares to treat them. One is surgical removal of the prostate, and the second is uh, radiation therapy. And radiation therapy uh, does have some risks and benefits from it, and there's some new technology that's come out that allows us to decrease the risks in men who have radiation therapy. Uh, during radiation, uh, radiation beams are essentially pointed and shot into the prostate itself, but some of the surrounding tissue may be impacted. Specifically, you can see here the bladder sits right above the prostate, so some of the radiation beams may hit the bladder, and the radiation beams may also hit the rectum, which is directly behind uh, the prostate. And if we could do something to reduce that radiation load that hits the rectum, that could reduce our GI toxicity. Specifically, we could reduce the number of men who may have rectal bleeding, uh, that have proctitis, diarrhea, inflammation of their rectum. And there is a hydrogel spacer that's now on the market that allows us to do that. And you can see on the left schematic, there's a prostate and the kind of an outline of where the radiation treatment encompasses. And you can see that the radiation field also overlies part of the rectum, and as a result, the rectum is involved in some radiation exposure. On the right schematic, you can see a device called Spacer, which is a small hydrogel that we insert between the rectum and the prostate that makes that space wider. Uh, and as a result, there's uh, a less radiation exposure to the prostate because this uh, gel-based uh, insertion is performed that pushes the prostate off from the anterior aspect of the radiation, ultimately re resulting in uh, decreased side effects from radiation therapy. This is a small video that I can walk you through how we actually perform this in our office, and maybe I can go back and make it play. Yeah, I think if you just click on the triangle, we should be able to get that to start. Tricky. the mouse upside down. 
There we go. So this is a picture of, you can actually see prostate. The urethra runs right through the prostate. There's the rectal urethralis, the rectal wall, and the rectum itself. And the perirectal fat space between the prostate and the rectum. During this procedure, it's usually performed under local anesthesia. Uh, we insert an ultrasound into a man's rectum that allows us to actually see the prostate in the area between the prostate and the rectum. A small needle is placed into this space through the skin underneath the scrotum uh, that's directly between the prostate and the rectum itself. We inject a small amount of water that results in a hydrodissection. It uh, actually makes the space in between the rectum and the prostate open so then we can inject the hydrogel uh, spacer itself. We make sure there is no blood supply involved in this area by aspirating slightly on the uh, needle, and then we inject the hydrogel directly in that space that we've created, and that creates about a one centimeter gap now that's available between the prostate and the rectum that decreases the radiation exposure to um, the rectum itself. It's an outpatient procedure performed in just a few minutes. Patients tolerate it quite well, uh, and we offer that uh, shortly here at UNC. So I can wrap up on my next slide, I think. Yeah, you can pass me the keyboard. For some reason, it seems to be uh, stuck on that particular slide. But we'll see if it's going to let it. There we go. Perfect. So. Just some conclusions and take-home messages that really MRI biopsy offers us a unique way to uh, risk stratify men and that we can detect more high-grade cancer that men would benefit treatment from while limiting the detection of low-risk disease that would uh, never affect a man's longevity. Allows us to increase our uh, risk stratification of men and as a result we can give personalized counseling to all men with prostate cancer and then lastly there is a uh, new uh, hydrogel spacer on the market that is an option for men who may consider going under radiation therapy for prostate cancer. And with that, I thank you for the opportunity to present some of our data. Great. Well, this brings us to the, the point in this talk where uh, you have an opportunity to ask questions of, of Meredith and of Dr. Beerland. So if you would please share those questions with us now. Uh, you can, um, we've got one coming in again, you can use the texting method or the, the web method that we went over earlier. So the hydrogel sounds awesome. Your slide says for three months, does it dissolve or does it need to be removed? It actually dissolves. There is okay. no surgical removal of it. So okay. uh, one time placement and then yeah, it does 90% water based. Uh, and it dissolves on its own after about three months. Great. That person was thinking just like me. I had written down retained, absorbed, removed. <laughs> so yeah. uh, good to know. That, that sounds very convenient. Uh, how useful is PSA velocity? Um, I'd say we use it, you know, in the initial screening process. But mm -hmm. then again, you know, it's a piece to this larger puzzle of multiple things we use to screen, including, you know, these other biomarkers. Um, you know, it's definitely, it's not, we don't discount PSA velocity. You know, we definitely take that into consideration in the larger picture. Is there anything you, you want to add to that? Yeah, something key about PSA velocity is you need enough points or enough PSA values to truly calculate the velocity. I mean, you need mm -hmm. at least three to look at that linear uptrend in PSA. Uh, but, but it is another component we use to risk stratify men and who, would, who would benefit from a biopsy. Great. Thank you. Uh, did each participant undergo a systematic BX as well as MRI-guided BX? So in our initial studies, all men underwent a systematic biopsy in addition to an MRI-guided biopsy because we were at the advent of this technology and we didn't know what we would be missing. Mm -hmm. So most of our patients underwent that, and now we've kind of moved to the area where we can counsel men on do you really need the 12 core systematic biopsy and what's the risks and benefits if we avoid that biopsy? Okay. Are various PSA results commonly used now? Are, are the various PSA results commonly used now? Um, 
So then maybe asking about what do we use kind of a, a, v, a PSA result to counsel all men? And there are some guidelines that based on a man's age, we can slightly adjust what the abnormal threshold is. And, then, and also based on a man's race, we all may have be able to be uh, slightly adjust what the threshold is. But universally, uh, there's some guidelines that we use four as a cutoff. There are some guidelines that recommend we can actually use a little bit less than four. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, what about genetic screening methods for risk assessment? Ah, yes, that is a very good question. Usually, right now, we have to have a family member diagnosed with cancer before we can genetically screen their other cancer or their other family members to see if they have a risk for cancer. If you just come to our clinic and say, I want to be screened for my risk of cancer, is it family related? We don't have a way of doing that. But in men who have prostate cancer um, and a first degree relative, or actually it's been linked to breast cancer as well, germline testing, uh, we can do things like that. Okay. Uh, this person says, sorry, the velocity, et cetera, I still only hear the PSA versus the other values you both mentioned. Uh, maybe, maybe referring to that are the various PSA results. So do we use velocity alone to make decisions for biopsy? Trying to understand this question a little sure, better, sure. but we don't use that alone, you know, to make decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, in a perfect world, we can get also, you know, perhaps other biomarkers uh, or an MRI on board to help us make the decision of whether or not to biopsy. Some ways I use PSA loss, and just for an example, in a man who's been screened for prostate cancer whose PSA is below that common threshold, but they're checked again and it's mm -hmm. gone up and it's checked again and it's gone up and it's checked again, maybe four, or four PSAs that are still underneath the threshold, but their PSA velocity is increasing. Mm -hmm. This is someone I would probably say, hey, it looks like you know PSA is not a great screening tool, but if we put all your data points together, they look like they're going in an upslope that is abnormal, we may consider getting an MRI or doing another biomarker. Right. Mm -hmm. And doubling time is another uh, term that we use sometimes, sort of, you know, maybe your PSA started at 0.4 and nature mm -hmm. was, was 0.8 and then, you know, uh, it's 1.6 the next year and it's over 3 the next year, you know, that would be a, a, a velocity that would be, you know, more concerning to us that we'd pair with other ways to screen you. Gotcha. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the latest data on predicting METS PS, PC, uh, PCA? So metastatic prostate cancer. So we look at a number of things uh, to determine if men who've been diagnosed with prostate cancer have metastatic disease. Mm -hmm. uh, the guidelines recommend that if they meet certain thresholds, meaning their PSA is above 20, or they have high risk disease, meaning Gleason 8 or higher, we try to uh, stage them to see if there's any metastatic disease in two different imaging modalities. One is a bone scan and one is a CAT scan. So we usually get both of those imaging modalities on a man who may have uh, risk for having metastatic disease. Uh, do you share the nomogram with the patient? The visual is excellent. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. it's, we've actually uh, published this in one of the urology journals, so it's available widely used, and ourself as well as other institutions use that nomogram. Uh, and as long as you're a believer in the MRI and you have that MRI variable to plug it in the nomogram, mm -hmm. we can use it quite well to counsel men on their risk of having disease. Mm -hmm. Well, we are running out of time, and um, I'm glad that our audience had so many questions. I had about 15 written down, so I'll have to save this. Oh, here's one last one. We'll take this last one. Do you believe in doing yearly free screenings, just PSA blood test? So, yeah, so I, I do. The, the guidelines uh, now, I think, have come almost full circle where the majority of governing bodies, both the cancer kind of guidelines, the primary care guidelines, the urology guidelines, say that we should screen men in a shared decision model, meaning talk to men about the risks and benefits of PSA, about how PSA is not an ideal blood test, but it is a blood test we use. And if men understand the risks and benefits of uh, PSA and PSA screening, then they can make an informed decision on that something they want to do. Maybe I can answer one last question at my own. Um, is, there a, is there a psychological impact? Is it helpful with, the, with the MRI to be, a, as opposed to just transitioning from PSA and other information straight to the biopsy? Is there some sort of psychological impact of saying next we'll do uh, uh, the MRI, uh, which is a little less invasive, and then if necessary, based on those findings? And are you ultimately more likely to get somebody to the point of, of doing the biopsy if necessary? 
I think so. Really, that stepwise approach gives men a number of layers of information and confidence to make their decision. The way I manage patients with an elevated PSA, I actually get them a biomarker and an MRI, and I can counsel them that I'm going to try to do everything I can to avoid a prostate biopsy right. on you. And right. only if all of these marks tick off that say, you know what, you're really the type of man that may harbor some type of disease that would benefit from a prostate biopsy, at that point would I put them through a biopsy. And they feel really very sure that that is necessary. When yeah, absolutely. That we've, we've done our due diligence and said, you know, really you're in the risk category that we should move on with a biopsy. Thank great. you both so much. Yeah. This is great. Thank you. Uh, just a few things to wrap up. I want to thank uh, the generous support of the North Carolina General Assembly for the University Cancer Research Fund, the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. We want to thank our team, Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell for all the work that they do for this and every one of our lectures. Uh, upcoming, uh, May 22nd, we have our med medical and surgical oncology lecture, The Role and Importance of HPV Infection in Head and Neck Cancer with Trevor Hackman, and then uh, RN and Allied Health again, June 12th, Helping Patients with Breast Cancer with Catherine Harrell. So we hope you'll join us for both of those. More courses are available through our learning portal, uh, now Immunological Mechanisms in Pancreatic Cancer and Cancer-Related Cognitive Impairment, more than a side effect of chemotherapy. So we hope you'll check those out if you didn't get to see the live lectures. Pass that information on to your friends and colleagues. Uh, you know where to find us, UNCCN. Dot org. We're here. Uh, send us your questions, your comments, and we'll see you at our next lecture. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Tim. Thank, thank you so you. much. Really Absolutely. appreciate having you here. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.